This is uh, Twin Lakes, Colorado. It uh, is nestled in this little valley. It sits below the highest point in Colorado, which is Mount Elbert. Uh, it sits in front of uh, the largest natural glacial lake in Colorado. And uh, my dad somehow fell in love with this place because he bought a lot here and started building this cabin. There was no other structures around. And he was probably the first to build on this hill. In fact, he was the first to build on this hill. And I see why he chose this place. It looks like his homeland in uh, northern Italy, uh, near the village where he came from of San Lorenzo. And I see why he fell in love with this. On the left are my mother's parents, Silvio and uh, Marina, uh, and this, these on the right are my father's parents, Antonio Pancrasi, and uh, his wife was Amelia Cirolini. This is my mother, Speranza Matare Pengrassi. And this is my father, Fiore Innocente Pengrassi. They came here in uh, December of 1920 to uh, Telluride, Colorado. A lot of people from that area, from our town, was here in the community between Uray and Silverton. More than they were uh, in Montrose. There were a few in Montrose also, but not like it was Uray, Silverton, and Telluride. And then some of them were in Utah. Some of them were in Leadville. And so it's funny. In a way, they had an idea, but they didn't know what to expect when you got here. La suocera si voleva che il vaghi in Italia, nel suo paese, a sposarsi. Sì. E lei era arrivata con il mio zio. Mio zio veniva dal, dal Wyoming, Wyoming e, e dopo il mio marito si chiamava Domenico e veniva giù a trovare il zio e, e, e ci siamo conosciuti lì, così. E dopo, e siamo arrivati dentro la sera, tardi, era scuro, scuro in giù. E, e la mattina quando sono alzata, e sono andata fuori e guardando, oh mai, 
que haveram de fato a vir deste país. Cosa que era espaventava? Oh, tudo, tudo este, este cross, este montanha. E me faz paura. E lá, pô, me sono habituada. When they came, he said there was still uh, quite a bit of discrimination against, against uh, the people that came from. At the time he came, it was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. That was before the World War I, and therefore they spoke the Italian dialect, but they were considered Austrians as they were on their passport. But uh, uh, he, he felt that there was considerable dis discrimination against people of, of the northern part of Italy and in Italy in itself, there, this community was pretty much settled by uh, miners that were either Welshmen, Englishmen, or Irish or different people. But uh, he had a, a difficult time until they established themselves. <laughs> One time, somebody told me I lived in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, Italian part of town, and I said, "Well, I don't really uh, know that." But then I got to thinking, in the uh, couple block radius of where I lived, we had all these Italian names like Pricos and uh, Scalas and Zanellas and Falens and uh, Rossi's and so forth. So I guess I did live in the. Italian part of town, even though it's a small town and about six blocks or ten blocks long, it, it just uh, that's that's part of it. They lived there. Well, there was a lot of discrimination in those days. The Irish, the Italians, you know how how they use they abuse the word uh, uh, "wop." Well, because when they were going through Ellis Island, the inspectors. They couldn't pronounce the names. And if any of these people didn't have any papers, they say, without papers, W-O-P, without papers. So that became a slang word for them. They didn't have papers, but it, then they put that to the whole group of Italians. And uh, there was a discrimination on that. And the same with Dago. Dago here, Dago there, you know, they picked it up. But we didn't like to be called a Dago or a Wop by anybody except our own race. They needed miners and they needed workers. And they knew that these people, especially from our region in Italy, were hardworking people. Hell, they only paid them maybe $2.50 a day. And they worked eight, 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They wanted them to work and they would work because they wouldn't make that back home that much. And if they became skilled miner, they got as high as $3 or $3.50 a day. Oh yeah, it was always dangerous, and mining was always dangerous, because you never knew, you know, you had to be awful careful uh, when you would go back in after you'd blast. You'd have to be careful, you know, that you didn't have loose rock hanging around and different things like that. They didn't, what they do is they, they would take as, as least of the waste as they could. They was always trying to make sure that they could stay with the ore. Because, you know, it was a lot of work trying to get to it. 
and they used to what they'd do they'd uh, go in and and drill alongside of the ore would be like in what they called a vein you know and they'd go in and they'd drill alongside of it and, with single jacks and then they'd pop that waste down and get rid of it and then they'd come back and get the ore off of it on the next shoot. Then he'd bring it out outside and then they'd still clean it better, trying to get more of the rock away from the ore. And then they'd, then they'd ship it to the smelters. Everybody was paid the same if, if they could do the job. If, if you were an Irishman over there or an Englishman, he didn't get paid more than this Italian over here. No, no. They, they, judged, they judged about the amount of work. Because you've got to remember who really built this country. You know who built the railroad in here? Or the bulk of the world of the workers were Tyrolean and Chinese that helped build this railroad from Durango up. Oh. They were good, hard workers. They come from nothing, so to speak, to something here. And then, you know, there's safety in numbers, so to speak. When you get a colony of groups of people together, they figure out how to make some money. And what was the best way to make money in a mining town? A saloon. A saloon. My grandfather had a saloon over there in that boarding house. And when they built this one, they had a saloon downstairs in here. where you were born and raised because I was 16, almost 16 when I left. So I do have memory of there and it stays with you. You just don't throw it out the window. It just, and also it stayed the knowledge that you got before you left there and came into this country. For me, that's my experience. You know, the knowledge that I had there, I see families and things, and you take it with you. There's no more Trentini living here. I'm the only one in this town. They're gone, they're dead, they're gone. They're aborto at the uh, cemetery or they left town. I don't have anybody in this town that's of Trentini. Not one person. None of my family of the olders are all dead and gone. So I says, I'm going to put in the paper, help. I need help to dress up the land around the Trentini monument, and I'll make you a, de genified, a, de a genuine, I'll adopt you as a Trentini. <laughs> Phil and I got to talking. He says, maybe we ought to build a monument. I says, to the Tyrolians. I said, well, hell, that ain't a bad idea. Why is it so important? Yeah. Because of our people, what they did here. I, you read the cemetery book, how many were killed in the mines, come over here, left their families to come over and make money to bring back. They died during the flu epidemic. Young men, 25 years old, 20, 19, they died. We had a huge volume of Trentini people here at that time. And you know, if they took you out of your home over there in dear old Italy and transplanted you someplace foreign, you wouldn't like it either, would you? No, you wouldn't. You'd always go back. It's just human nature, the way I feel about it. <laughs> 